Well, thank you very much. Good uh, morning, everyone. I must say that um, I've been introduced by a lot of people in a lot of places. This is the first time I've ever been introduced as a good husband. Uh, that sounds good, but when I realize how most of the, invita of the uh, introductions are grossly exaggerated, I, I fear that this one falls into the same category. But thank you, Shirley Lynn. It's one of the nicest things anybody's ever said. Um, let's see, where is my little clicker here? There it is. Um, as you know, what I'm going to do now is to talk a bit about the United States' relationship to the Belt and Road Initiative. And I'm going to organize it around the roles that the United States has played and continues to play and may in the future play with regard to uh, this uh, important uh, international uh, development. I'm pushing something wrong, I think. Maybe. I couldn't get that to work. You, could, you, could, you couldn't get it to work either. OK, great. OK, fine. All right. Uh, there, here we go. OK, there we go. Uh, and you'll see that I'll start by describing its original role, paradoxically, as a stimulus, then as an obstacle, then as a critic, now as a competitor, and then raise the possibility that there's some chance that it might become a partner uh, further down the road. Interestingly, for all of those Americans who are concerned about the Belt and Road Initiative for any number of reasons, the United States actually, in an important way, was a stimulus for the Belt and Road Initiative and the creation of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank because it was a major cause, not the only one, but a major cause of Asia's infrastructure investment gap. Why do I say this? I say this because in the 1990s and the early 2000s, the United States was really a harsh critic of the previous emphasis on infrastructure construction. That had characterized a number of initiatives in the past, a lot of what the World Bank had been doing, and what the Asian Development Bank would continue to do. I was involved peripherally with the World Bank and more, somewhat more centrally with the Asian Development Bank in those days. And I can tell you that the World Bank was beginning to expand its portfolio of activities uh, both its lending, but even more its technical advice, uh, arguing first that, yes, physical infrastructure was important, but policy was more important, developmental policy, than the institutions that would make and implement development policy in developing countries was more important, and it was beginning to penetrate down to the societal level not only non-governmental organizations, which really was part then of the institutional infrastructure, but getting down to questions of uh, economic culture, entrepreneurial culture, uh, and so forth. So a huge expansion of the portfolio in which in, uh, infrastructural investment then played uh, relatively a smaller role. I was more involved with the Asia Development Bank when it was uh, developing under pressure from the United States, even though the Asian Development Bank historically has been led by Japanese. And the Japanese, of course, have always emphasized infrastructure development. It was something called the, uh, the uh, long-term uh, pl uh, planning framework. Uh, and it was under considerable pressure to do the same, to basically move away from infrastructure investment to take on these uh, additional responsibilities which were seen as being more important. Now, why was this? In part, it was a, an accurate reflection of the fact that physical infrastructure can only be one part of a development package. Uh, and it was also an awareness of some of the problems that might come with infrastructure development. Uh, in particular, the problem of corruption. We now talk, as Brantley has indicated, of the questions of sustainability, particularly with regard to environment. Uh, that was not the major focus of the critique then. It was very much uh, a matter of uh, corruption. These large-scale projects that involve necessarily host governments, therefore host government officials and politicians, were susceptible to, uh, to uh, uh, shall we say, skimming some of the cream off the top of the, development, uh, of the development project. Just a few weeks ago now, I had the chance to talk with somebody who worked in the World Bank in those days. And I asked about the kind of the politics of this. I said, why did the United States feel this? 
uh, so intensely. And uh, the answer for what it's worth uh, was that because American construction companies were very worried about being caught up in the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act if they engaged in what they thought was the necessary bribery that they would have to engage in to be able to bid and then participate in infrastructure development uh, projects, construction projects. And so the, that kind of base of support from the United States uh, also began to, uh, uh, to evaporate. Now, perhaps it was there for, uh, for that reason uh, that as the uh, World Bank and the ADB began to deprioritize infrastructural investment, uh, why, uh, other, uh, why there emerged this very large uh, investment gap uh, that uh, Ambassador Mull has already uh, mentioned, estimated by the Asian Development Bank, being around a total of $900 uh, billion. Uh, of that, with about roughly half of that was for uh, so-called economic infrastructure, uh, this other half roughly uh, for social infrastructure. Not quite sure what those categories are, how they're defined. But it was widely regarded that uh, acknowledged that there was an investment uh, gap that might have been regardless of what the international financial institutions did. But the needs were great, and as Brantley has implied in talking about the United States, infrastructure has to be reinvested in, it has to be updated, it has to be repaired and maintained. So it's an ongoing need for all countries and a growing need for the developing countries uh, in Asia. And that need was not, uh, was not being, uh, being met. So that while the United States can then complain or question or challenge uh, what China has done to meet this need, I think it's important for Americans to understand how we contributed to this need in the first place as we are contributing uh, in many ways to some of the initiatives that China is undertaking. Our own broken political infrastructure, the problems with our democratic institutions, are making it possible for China to present what it would regard as an authoritarian meritocratic alternative. And they are backing away from free trade agreements. Uh, it enables China, uh, somewhat ironically, uh, to present itself now as the new global champion of, of free trade. Uh, so the United States is actually opening the way for a variety of Chinese initiatives. And if we don't like those, then we should ask what role did we play in making those initiatives uh, possible. Um, once the Chinese began to act on this, uh, the United States then uh, served as, uh, as an obstacle. And before I get into this, let me say I just added in my notes on the basis of our very rich earlier discussion uh, this morning, uh, another role, and that would be cynic. I think a cynical uh, examination of basically what China was, uh, what China was doing. There was a sense uh, that China was engaged in exactly what Brantley called a recentering uh, of uh, Asia around itself, of becoming uh, Asia's new central uh, central kingdom, and a concern that being the center or being, as Brantley has said, a, uh, a node or a hub uh, does provide certain ongoing benefits uh, and creates the possibility of dependent relationships. Much of the language of the cynicism uh, comes very ironically from world systems theory, comes from dependency theory. What I studied as a graduate student what Americans, uh, sort of establishment political scientists, uh, harshly criticized in those days. But basically that same idea, that those who create networks, whether they're economic or physical, are basically doing so for selfish reasons. It may be, as the Chinese say, win-win, but the center wins far more than the periphery. Uh, and so it was a cynical view of what the motivation was for China. Uh, and uh, a cynical view about the effects of that, the distribution of, uh, of benefits. I'm not saying that the cynicism was fair or accurate, uh, but I'm just saying that it did exist. Uh, and that cynicism then lay, led to the second, or third rather, uh, role that I want to talk about, and that is the obstacle. As you may know, those of you who've been interested in this issue, the United, one of the more notable failures, even embarrassments, in recent American foreign policy uh, in, this, uh, in this area has been our unsuccessful opposition to the creation of the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. We expended enormous political capital 
uh, to try to uh, dissuade our friends and allies from joining on, becoming members and providing some of the early uh, capitalization. Uh, that failure, that uh, effort failed abysmally. Not only does uh, the Asian in uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank now have, and it depends on whether we're counting members or prospective members. So I'm going to give you a slightly different number. Uh, what I saw was 69 members with several others standing in line, a capitalization of something like $100 billion, um, and um, including members, including some of our closest allies, especially the United Kingdom and France, uh, the only major country that um, the United States has not been able, uh, has been able to, to dissuade, probably it needed little dissuasion given its role in the Asian Development Bank, is Japan. So basically the United States and Japan are the only major holdouts from joining this, uh, this organization. And I would say, before I get into the question of being a, uh, an active critic as opposed to a skeptic, the performance of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank has been, by my, as I understand it, has been excellent. It has overcome all of the doubts that were put forward at the time, that it would be an alternative, politically motivated uh, form of loose lending and financing. Uh, basically, this would not be best practice. It would not be gold standard development institution building. It would be building, uh, creating something that would be uh, corrupt, uh, that would be politically motivated. Uh, I think that has not really been the case so far. Uh, its track record is still, of course, relatively small, relatively young organization. But I think that we uh, were a, uh, we uh, unsuccessfully opposed it, and so far it has been the most uh, uh, reputable and, in that sense, successful part of the financing mechanism. We've now been a critic, and here we have quite a bit more to, uh, uh, to criticize. Uh, as has been said, uh, most of the Asian, uh, the Belt and Road uh, projects outside the AIIB uh, have been basically financed through commercial lending uh, by Chinese commercial banks and by Chinese policy banks, uh, either directly to governments or to Chinese state-owned enterprises that are involved in them. Uh, these, um, let's just say, uh, many of the projects have been flawed, not all, uh, but many. Some have been harshly criticized for the lack as usually these projects have been historically, the uh, use of Chinese labor and managers as opposed to, uh, to local, uh, the fact that the, uh, the, the loans do need to be, uh, to be repaid, an absence of concern about environmental considerations and so forth. But the main concern has been that financing structure. And as Brantley has said, it is difficult in the short run for infrastructure projects to uh, generate a specific uh, return that can be attributed specifically to them and used to, uh, to pay back. So the United States has been extremely critical of the Belt and Road on that basis. Uh, in his, one of his, maybe the very last speech he made in Africa before he learned that he had been fired as Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson gave a vitriolic uh, condemnation of these uh, using all of the language that I've mentioned basically predatory lending, uh, creating of dependency, a restriction on sovereignty. The catchphrase, not that he used it, but others have, is loan to own. You lend money knowing that it probably will not be paid back, and then because the project has been put up as collateral, you end up owning a significant part, uh, if, not, uh, if not all of it. So we've been a sharp critic of the Belt and Road once it's gotten underway, but tellingly, the focus has been on this one track, state-owned Chinese enterprises uh, through commercial uh, and uh, policy lending, rather than the AIIB, which I think has been um, far less subject to this kind of, uh, of criticism. Next, we are now serving as a kind of uh, competitor. Uh, we are putting forward and have just formed uh, an alternative mechanism uh, through something called the BUILD Act, B-U-I-L-D, uh, uh, which is building, uh, uh, what is it, building something through uh, uh, investment. Uh, I can't, can't quite remember what it stands for. Uh, but basically, it's the creation of a new international development finance uh, corporation, uh, which is going to bring together 
uh, part of the uh, other aspects of U.S. government developing government financing, most uh, particularly the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, or OPIC, and some of the lending and uh, 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 lending uh, aspects of U.S. AID. The idea here is that it will also be able to support uh, equity investment in uh, infrastructure uh, development projects uh, around the world. This is global. It's not specifically Asia-focused. Uh, and uh, its aim is to encourage uh, private investors, private equity, to invest with loan guarantees uh, and with some capitalization by, uh, even by other governments. Uh, Japan and Australia are now part of this, uh, of this new uh, IDFC. Um, it is just barely getting underway. As far as I could tell yesterday, it doesn't even have its own website yet, uh, and so it doesn't have a track record. Its capitalization is authorized by Congress. The total of loan guarantees and uh, equity investment uh, and, uh, and loans is something on the order of um, $60 billion. Uh, so it is far less than the AIIB's $100 uh, billion. Uh, but um, we don't know whether it will be used more effectively uh, without some of the same problems or whether it will encounter difficulties of its own, uh, of its own kind. I'll conclude with a kind of a uh, somewhat paradoxical proposition, and that is that um, could it be possible that the United States will actually end up uh, partnering with China, or China partnering with the U.S. in this area, a critically important area of infrastructural investment. Um, the, uh, given the performance of the AIIB, which so far I believe has been admirable, would it now be possible for the United States to finally join? Would the Chinese be willing? Would the other members be willing? Uh, and would uh, the Americans now be willing to join the AIIB? Much of what the AIIB is doing is also in partnership with the other international financial institutions, uh, such as the ADB and the World Bank. Uh, so it is becoming increasingly broadly based in its planning and in its financing. And so one uh, question to put on the table is exactly this. Is it now time for the United States to accept not only the failure of its attempts to block the creation of the AIIB, but the quite successful early years of that institution uh, and join it. Uh, that would be one possibility. Obviously, what we could bring to that institution is a further discussion of the relative importance of and the relative weights to be given in both technical advice and in lending and to the extent that any grants are involved, grant making, to these additional aspects of development work beyond infrastructure, uh, policy, institution building, uh, the creation of uh, economic cultures in various ways that uh, contribute to successful uh, development. This is a possibility that I've not explored in any detail, but I put it on the table as something that uh, might be, uh, might be uh, possible. The other possibility uh, is that uh, China might be brought into uh, this new International Development Finance Corporation. Uh, as I've said, uh, we have opened the door to uh, at least two other governments to participate, uh, the governments of Japan and Australia. Uh, and this, I think, is a much longer shot, uh, given the suspicion of China in the United States now. Uh, but at least hypothetically, uh, you could begin to bring in a small scale uh, at first, but to begin to bring in uh, Chinese uh, corporations or simply Chinese uh, equity funds, uh, venture funds, that Shirley can talk more about uh, into this process if the U.S.-China relationship begins to, uh, begins to improve. So in sum then, the United States has played a variety of different, uh, of different roles over the years. I'm particularly uh, focused on the way in which we help to create a problem which then Belt and Road is intended to, uh, to resolve or to uh, ameliorate. Uh, we have then moved from uh, highly skeptical, highly critical, highly obstructionist to a situation now where uh, we might want to consider some kind of partnership uh, with China in at first limited but perhaps growing ways. I think we are maybe not in a new Cold War uh, precisely because the old Cold War involved uh, two uh, centers that were completely 
territory, almost completely um, separate from each other. Uh, U.S. and China and the groupings that for which we serve as centers are highly interdependent. Uh, so that is extreme and a very, very important, uh, important difference. But to the extent that we are more and more competitive, another aspect of the Cold War, ideationally competitive, as well as economically and, I fear, militarily uh, competitive, it's important to continue to find areas of cooperation and partnership uh, to go along with the competition. And I'm suggesting that while there will be an important aspect of competition here, which model of infrastructure development uh, work, financing works better, uh, which uh, model of economic development more generally uh, is more successful. There are areas for cooperation and partnership which this new relationship uh, with China, a more competitive one, needs carefully to cultivate. Thanks very much.